Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientist and for scientist. Once a month, we bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. This episode is brought to you by Dysel Arbor Biosciences, a biotech company that specializes in targeted next-generation sequencing, in-situ hybridization probe design, and cell-free protein expression. They have served their customers in plant genetics, microbiology, agriculture, archaeology, oncology, and genetic disease areas for more than 15 years. Plant biotechnology is becoming an accepted avenue for pharmaceutical development. Researchers have engineered plants to grow biomolecules that can be made into therapeutics, including vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. These new technologies hold the promise of more readily bringing treatments to low- to middle-income countries and providing rapid responses to future pandemics. In this episode, Nikki Spaich from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Julian Ma, the Director of the Institute for Infection and Immunity and Professor of Molecular Immunology at St. George's Hospital Medical School to learn more. Many modern medicines, including vaccines and therapeutic antibodies for cancer and infectious disease treatment, are produced in sterile facilities where scientists grow cells expressing genetically modified or recombinant proteins in huge stainless steel bioreactors. Such facilities are expensive, which precludes pharmaceutical production in low- to middle-income countries, or LMICs. Julian Ma envisions a future where all countries can produce medicines to meet their individual needs by using plants as bioreactors for protein production in a process called molecular farming. The reason I'm interested in molecular farming is because of the desperate need and opportunity to address global health. One thing that we really haven't thought about much until this SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is how to have equitable access to pharmaceuticals across the world particularly in the area of infectious diseases in the West until 2020. Infectious diseases weren't really on the radar anymore. We used to die of infectious diseases, but now we have antibiotics, we have vaccines, and we have good public health. Infectious diseases as a cause of death became almost insignificant, but that's not true in developing countries and low and middle income countries. Trying to get something that is accessible in LMICs became really important. What molecular farming offers is a totally innovative way of making recombinant proteins. The two great advantages would be cost of production and scalability. You could envisage growing fields of recombinant protein plants. Most people know how to grow plants around the world. And in fact, agricultural practice is very strong in LMICs. And so this is potentially a transferable technology. If you're an LMIC with infectious disease problems, or let's say rabies, dengue, chikungunya, which are not major problems in the West, you're never going to persuade a pharmaceutical giant to help you develop a vaccine or drugs against that. The only way to cope with that is to try and develop it yourself. But how can you do that if you don't have a technology platform? Molecular farming offers some exciting opportunities there. Plant biotechnology encompasses both producing proteins in plant cell culture and in whole plants grown in greenhouses or outdoor fields. When plant biotech first exploded in the 1990s, scientists expressed proteins in a variety of plant species. Eventually, concerns around genetically modified crops, especially the accidental contamination of non-GM fields with genetically modified seeds, also spread to recombinant protein production in plants. In response, many researchers changed gears and turned to tobacco because it is not a food crop. Tobacco has many advantages for molecular farming. It is easily genetically modified, is large leaves, the site of recombinant protein production, and it can grow all over the world, making the transfer of molecular farming technology to LMICs easier. Additionally, as smoking tobacco has declined in popularity, many tobacco farmers could easily transition their fields and participate in this new technology. But while tobacco has become the lab mouse of the plant biotech world, some scientists are still working on alternative models. In order to make a protein, you express it in the leaves. You harvest the leaves and you grind those up in buffer and extract a soluble extract. Now, there are some disadvantages because now you're dealing with fresh leaf material. And so you have to go from fresh plant to some point in your downstream process quite quickly because plants also produce a lot of proteases and will degrade your proteins. There are some huge advantages 
to using food crops like maize or rice. You could grow your crop and store your product as a seed. You could have silos that farmers normally use for storing grain as your seed bank, as it were. That's a great way of stockpiling partially processed material if you want to go to a rapid production vaccine. The third option, and this was a very early thought in the field, was using edible crops like tomatoes, bananas, potatoes, where if you express the protein in the edible crop, then you could deliver the vaccine without purification. You could deliver it by the oral route. And I think that's still quite exciting. But in Europe, we haven't quite got over the GM food issue. And there are other technical issues to overcome, like managing yield and reproducibility of dose, as it were. Ma focuses on producing monoclonal antibodies in tobacco that could be used to treat infectious diseases in LMICs. He started this work while in the laboratory of Andrew Hyatt, a pioneer of monoclonal antibody production in plants. Ma and Hyatt went on to show that plant-derived monoclonal antibodies could be used pharmaceutically. These were surprising feats because plants do not make antibodies naturally. But given the right set of genes, they could pump out antibodies that even some mammalian cells cannot produce. Plant-made antibodies are virtually identical to those produced in more commonly used mammalian cells, such as Chinese hamster ovary or CHO, C-H-O, cells. The only difference is that plants attach carbohydrates to proteins, or glycosylate, in a slightly different way compared to mammals, which could make the proteins behave differently. To circumvent this problem, researchers have engineered the plant glycosylation pathway to be more like the human version. Further tweaking of plant glycosylation can result in what researchers call biobetter antibodies, which are engineered to have improved properties and can create more potent immune responses when injected therapeutically. Most antibody therapeutics rely on monoclonal antibodies, which precisely bind a single region on an antigen target. Monoclonal antibodies have received much interest lately as a therapy against SARS-CoV-2, but injecting antibodies to target and kill pathogenic microbes in a process called passive immunization has been around for centuries. There are lots of ways to use monoclonal antibodies. You can either use it post-infection, and the great advantage of passive immunization is that the effect is immediate. You don't have to wait for the immune response to kick in two or three weeks after a vaccination. As soon as you deliver the antibody, it gets to work. Towards the end of the last century, we were still using it in a preventative manner as well. So prophylactically, we were giving antibodies against hepatitis A to travelers, for example then you could travel to hepatitis A endemic regions and you would get protection for as long as the antibody stayed in your system, which was generally about three to four weeks. Then there's an intermediate thing called post-exposure prophylaxis. And an example of that is rabies. So if you get bitten by a wild dog, you don't know if you've got the infection or not. But what they do is they inject antibodies around the wound. Recombinant proteins produced in plant cell culture or by molecular farming have low production costs and high yields. However, their pharmaceutical applications have been limited. One famous example of this technology is ZMAP, the monoclonal antibody treatment for Ebola. This drug cocktail is made from three monoclonal antibodies produced by transient expression via a viral vector in tobacco plants. Because of the urgent need for a treatment during the 2014 Ebola outbreak, it was used experimentally in humans without undergoing clinical trials. Its supply was very limited, but by attacking the Ebola virus, ZMAP treatment saved the lives of several individuals who contracted the disease while aiding people during the outbreak. In general, plant-derived recombinant proteins are only slowly coming to the human treatment arena, but scientists are making headway with clinical trials for monoclonal antibodies against diseases such as HIV and COVID-19. One of the problems we faced from the start is it's a new paradigm for making biologics and completely new technologies, and so the regulators had to address not just new products, but actually the new manufacturing platform, something that was vastly different from what was considered the gold standard. And I think there was a lot of hesitancy about investing in molecular farming in the early days. I think a lot of people just didn't believe you could make pharmaceutical grade products. There's a process called good manufacturing practice that you have to follow, and that assures the quality of your products. And what we're comparing is enormous factories using stainless steel, in highly sterile conditions, and a greenhouse growing plants in soil, you can see why there was a lot of skepticism. One of Ma's first regulatory successes was with HIV monoclonal antibodies. Because a vaccine against HIV has been elusive, researchers also explore alternative treatment options. 
Additionally, while antiretroviral therapy, or ART, has been very effective in controlling the HIV pandemic in some parts of the world, its daily dosage requirement can be demanding, and there are fears of drug resistance. To show the safety and efficacy of antibodies grown in plants, Ma and his colleagues published a paper in 2015 reporting their production process and human clinical trial results for an HIV-neutralizing monoclonal antibody made in tobacco plants. For this trial, they chose an antibody that scientists had previously made by traditional means in CHO cells grown in stainless steel bioreactors and was approved for clinical trials. While this antibody had limitations for actual therapeutic use, its safety and efficacy when grown in mammalian cell culture was well documented. We knew what the quality of the product would need to be to make it comparable to the CHO version. And we achieved that. That was a bit of a breakthrough for our field because we got the first license to make antibodies in plants for clinical trials, and we got approval to go into the clinical trial. The clinical trial was great. There were no adverse events. We published the whole process of making the antibody in plants, and we made that publicly available so that companies could see what the regulators had asked us to do and how we had gotten through those issues. Since then, Ma's team has expressed several antibodies against HIV in plants. HIV mutates very quickly, so any effective HIV antibody treatment needs to be made from a cocktail of antibodies to avoid the pathogen developing resistance to a single one. Most effective are the broadly neutralizing antibodies that target the conserved parts of HIV antigens. Because these epitopes rarely mutate, the antibodies work against many different genetic variants of HIV. Many of these broadly neutralizing antibodies were first isolated by other research groups from elite controllers, people who were uniquely resistant to HIV infection, prior to Ma's team engineering their production in plants. One of these antibodies is N6, which binds to a conserved region of the GP120 protein located on the HIV surface. After expressing and purifying N6 from tobacco, Ma's team compared its characteristics, including binding kinetics to GP120 and ability to neutralize various HIV strains, to N6 expressed in mammalian cells. They found that the antibodies produced in plants performed equivalently, if not better, than those made by the traditional cell culture method. We're working with several of the more modern, broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibodies. We've got three candidates that we're really excited about. And we've got to the stage now where we have demonstrated that they express really well in plants. And we are doing what's called the techno-economic feasibility now, showing what the potential price of production in plants would be and what the potential scalability of production in plants would be. Ma and his team intend to investigate these candidates in various applications, including the prevention of maternal-to-child transmission of HIV in pregnant women, which can occur while in utero, during delivery, or while breastfeeding. Antibody therapy during pregnancy is commonly used to treat rhesus disease, a condition that occurs when a woman with an Rh-negative blood type is pregnant with an Rh-positive fetus. In these cases, the woman's immune system attacks Rh antigens present in the fetus's blood. Rhesus antibody therapy neutralizes stray Rh antigens that would otherwise trigger the maternal immune system. We would like to do something similar with anti-HIV monoclonal antibodies. The problem there is that pregnant women who are HIV positive can pass HIV onto their child. Now, that's not a problem if it's known early that they are HIV positive. If they start treatment with traditional anti-HIV treatments in the first trimester, then by the time the baby is delivered, their viral load will be almost zero. And so the risk of what's called MTCT, mother-to-child transmission, is virtually zero. The problem arises if the mother doesn't know that they're HIV positive or they don't go to the doctor until later in the pregnancy. And that's when it turns out they're HIV positive. In those cases, giving antiretroviral therapy doesn't help. But giving a monoclonal antibody or antibodies might do because the effect will be almost immediate. You could envisage giving a dose of antibodies very close to delivery to provide the additional protection for the child during delivery. For most of these therapeutic applications, researchers primarily focus on developing IgG antibodies, which are composed of two components, the heavy and light chains. Their simplicity makes them easy to make in recombinant systems. IgG antibodies tend to break down and be ineffective in mucosal environments, such as the GI and respiratory tracts. Secretory IgA antibodies, however, are adapted to the harsh mucosal environment, but they are complex structures made from four different proteins, and their assembly is a multi-step process occurring in multiple cells. Luckily, plant cells are expert IgA makers, easily putting together all four parts within a single cell. 
Ma has a long-standing interest in developing IgA antibodies in plants to combat Streptococcus mutans, bacteria that cause tooth decay. More recently, his team produced IgA antibodies that target enterotoxigenic E. coli, or ETEC, which infects the gut and causes neonatal mortality in LMICs. Similar to his HIV data, Ma found that plant-produced IgAs were just as effective as those made in mammalian cells and protected against ETEC and mouse infection models. More recently, we've moved this technology to address SARS-CoV-2. Most of the attention has been around systemic vaccination and systemic drugs, including antibodies. Yet SARS-CoV-2 is a mucosal pathogen, enters through the respiratory tract. Commonly, you get mucosal symptoms, either in the gut or in the lungs and in the nose and in the mouth. You get loss of taste and loss of smell. So we've been particularly interested in what is the role of the mucosal immune system against SARS-CoV-2 and whether you can bolster that. And of course, an obvious question is, could you use secretory antibodies to protect against SARS-CoV-2 infection at mucosal sites? And that's something that we're addressing at the moment. While there are still hurdles to clear, molecular farming is on its way to becoming accepted by pharmaceutical industries around the globe. Ma has been pleasantly surprised at the response from regulators when working to get plant-produced proteins into clinical trials. Even in LMICs, he has collaborated with pharmaceutical regulators that are open to this innovative technology. In the future, he envisions plant biotechnology producing treatments for a number of infectious diseases. Moving forward, I do see some really exciting possibilities. And one of them is addressing the issue that we are struggling with with SARS-CoV-2, and that is how to get products to poorer countries. And if you do that by sharing technology, sharing manufacturing capacity, that's an admirable thing to do. There's another thing that I think that plants offer, which going to the future will make a big difference, and that is speed. I'd mentioned GM plants, and that's a slow technology, but it's a vastly scalable technology. But there's also transit expression, and that's how ZMAP was made. The huge advantage of it is that it gives tremendous speed. So it's been demonstrated, for example, in case of flu, that within a month of acquiring genetic sequence, over a million doses can be prepared using a plant platform. What we saw was that um, speed was the most important thing during this pandemic. So if you have a, a technology that offers you that kind of speed, I think that's going to be a huge advantage going forward. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Nikki Spodge. And thank you to Dysel Arbor Biosciences for sponsoring this episode. Please join us for our next episode as we learn about ancient secrets of disease spread. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.